Welcome to my talk. I'm Emil Björnsson. I'm a visiting professor at KTH, Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, and at Linship University. I'm an associate professor, and I will talk about reconfigurable intelligent surfaces for wideband communications, particularly focused on some of the challenges that are appearing in those situations and possible solutions. I will first have an introduction to what is reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, how do they operate, how do that do their operation compared to beam forming and reflections of conventional surfaces. And that will lead us into system modeling. First, the conventional system modeling for narrowband channels, then the wideband channel modeling and how that differs in terms of how we can configure these surfaces to improve our communication systems. When it comes to wireless communication in general, the purpose is of course to provide as good service as possible. And since we are putting up infrastructure for this, such as base stations and rooftops and in towers at just a sparse number of locations, the performance that you can get, the signal strength, varies a lot depending on where you are. So this is a conventional antenna, sector antenna that is transmitting a fixed beam down to earth and into a sector of a say 120 degrees. And if you are a fortunate user who is seeing the base station, so you have a line of sight channel and you are also within the main beam here, you will get a strong signal. But if you are an unfortunate user, which in this case is behind the building and not really within even the main beam here, because if the signal should try to make it around this building, it needs to go out of the main beam and then it needs to bounce with this building and then it will probably m mainly be reflected further away. So there will be some signals making it to this point, but this is really an unfortunate user due to the directivity being steered towards the wrong direction and that buildings will reflect the signal and not in a favorable manner. What we have been doing in 5G is to add functionalities at the base stations, such as massive MIMO or multi-user beam form, we can call it. So we are removing the conventional sector antennas and instead we have these antenna arrays that can send signals in different directions, many directions at the same time, at different frequencies or at the same frequency. And we can then have one beam that is going towards the fortunate user here. It's still a fortunate user. But this user over here can at least get a stronger signal by the fact that we can now beam form a signal focused towards this building here. It will still be reflected off the building in a way determined by how the building is deployed. But at least there will be more signal power here, so more of it will make it around the corner here. But what if we can evolve the wireless infrastructure in yet another manner? somehow control objects in the propagation environment in 6G and in that way make sure that the signal is not only reflected here but towards the far right but down towards the user in a focused manner. Is that something that we can achieve? Well that is the goal of reconfigurable meta surfaces which is a way of building materials that can change their electrical properties even if they are not mechanically changed. And we are often calling them reconfigurable intelligent surfaces or intelligent reflecting surfaces in the communication literature. So I will provide you with a background to how they function. But to really understand it well, I think it's good to start with how MIMO arrays are operating. So the beam forming there is created by constructive interference patterns. So say that we have two different antennas that are transmitting signals. It's the same signal at the same time. They are propagating like this. And then there are certain locations where the waves that comes from these two transmitters will add up constructively. And in other locations, they will add up destructively or at least not in phase, so they are uh, not amplifying each other. And in this case, you can see that the places where the equally colored waves are intersecting is pointing towards upwards here. And we can also see that sort of the, in the upward direction, all of the different waves here are going in the right direction. So we will essentially, if you're looking far from these two antennas, see a wave front that is focused upwards here. That is where we will get constructive interference. So essentially we have two different antennas. Both of them are 
radiators that are sending out the signal with no preferred directivity, equally strong upwards here in all directions. But when we are observing the two antennas transmitting at the same time, and we're measuring the signals in different directions, it will look like as if we had a directive transmission upwards. How can we make this directivity adaptive somehow, so that we can adapt depending on where the user is? Well, what we do then is that we adapt at what time we are transmitting from the different antennas with respect to each other. So here, the right antenna is transmitting a little bit later than the left antenna. Then we can see that the intersection between the waves are at pointing in this direction here, and the wave front will in the upwards right direction here be constructive, and that is where we will see a strong signal. So essentially, we transmit the same signal from two different antennas. Both of them have a fixed directivity, but the joint effect due to this delay of the signal at right antenna is that when we are measuring the signals, it will look like we have created a beam towards the right. So that is where we are getting a strong signal. How does this kind of principles appear when signals get reflected on different objects? Well, we can use something called the Huygens Fresnel principle uh, to understand what's happening. So say that we have one of these signals uh, that uh, we are observing far away, so it's a plane wave with wave fronts coming in like this. Here is a surface, and the wave will then hit different parts of the surface at different times because there is a small difference in propagation distance here. And the Huygens Fresnel principle says that when people like to figure out what happens with these waves when they get reflected, we could take the surface, we can chop it up into small pieces and then we can view it as if each of these pieces are re-radiating, they're scattering the signals like spherical waves, like if they were just antennas that are re-radiating the signals. And then we can figure out the directivity of the re-radiated signal based on how we are getting constructive interference of the pattern from these different antennas. So here we have three different antennas, they are transmitting the signals again, and that is what I have shown here, and the signal will first reach this point. So that's why uh, this wave have moved one, two, three times, so further away. Then it is this one, this one has only reflected two pieces, and then this one here is only one piece. And what we can see quite clearly here is that the blue signals are um, having a wave front that is pointing downwards here. So when we have this kind of uh, homogeneous surface, then we will get a plane wave in, plane wave out, and if you are familiar with the Snell's law, it's saying that when we come in from a certain angle here, it will leave with the same angle, uh, but on the other side of the orthogonal normal vector here. And that is what you can then see from the Huygens Fresnel principle. And this kind of principles and things like Snell's law are defined for infinitely sized surfaces, like a very large mirror, for example. And in optics, uh, you don't need to have a particularly large surface for something to actually be well approximated as being an infinitely large surface. If we cut down on the size of it, we can still apply the same kind of um, principle. The wave comes in from the right here, we are chopping up the surface into small pieces, each of these pieces are re-radiating the signals, and then the constructive interference patterns of this sort of antenna array, where the signal gets sort of delayed in different ways because the wave fronts are reaching different antennas at different times. That is creating the beam, in this case it is a beam downwards, just like here. What is the difference between these two different cases? Well, when we have an infinite large surface, a plane wave comes in, which from only one direction, and then it leaves in only one direction. When we have a finite sized surface, there is a beam going out, with not only one direction, but the main directivity, and then a beam width, which is saying where most of the signal energy is. And the beam width is inversely proportional to the surface width. So as the surface becomes infinitely large, the beam width shrinks to zero, and we only have one signal in one signal out. So how can we utilize the kind of principles in order to build surfaces where we can steer in which direction that the beam is going out? Well, it's all determined by the shape of the surface, the fact that different pieces are re-radiating signals with different phase shift depending on when the wave is hitting that part of the surface. What if we could 
have a surface that is not homogeneous, but instead have the possibility of changing the phase shifts at different locations. That is what we do when we apply beam forming with a reconfigurable intelligent surface. Here is such a surface. Here is a wave coming from a transmitter. And the colors here is showing one pattern of phase shifts that we are assigned to the signals before they get re-radiated according to the Huygens Fresnel principle. And in this case, we get the beam towards user one here. Then we have a control unit here that can change so that we all of a sudden have a different set of phase shifts. In this case, it reflects a signal towards user two over here. And then it uh, can change back and forth to other users or between the two users. So the surface here is divided into small elements, small enough so we could approximately use this kind of principles. Each element don't have a preferred directivity, but it scatters the signals almost uniformly in all directions. And then we can create a controllable phase shift through a switch. And uh, we will look later on exactly how one can potentially do this in one implementation example. But the main principle is that each element don't have a preferred directivity, but uh, we have varying impedances that are creating varying amplitudes and phase, and that is then creating the reflecting uh, pattern of the RAS. So if we look back, we started with having a normal reflection. Signal comes in here, it goes out here, it's the same angle in as angle out, but on the other side of the normal vector. And this is for a surface that is uh, flat. If we would have a bended surface, we can apply the Huygens-Fresnel principle again. And this is uh, the kind of uh, principles that we're having in a um, satellite receiver, for example, where we have a parabolic surface. And if we are computing the uh, constructed interference pattern of all these different elements, you will see that we will get a reflected signal that is focused on a particular point here because of the surface being bended. What if we would like to do the same thing, but with a flat surface? What should we do? Well, the main principle is that in these two cases, the surface have a physical shape, but it is otherwise homogeneous. If we are instead having a flat surface, but it have a heterogeneous properties, different impedances at different locations, creating different phase shifts of the signals in different parts of the surface, then it could be flat, Mechanically, it's flat, geometrically it's flat, but it is electrically behaving as if it's bended because the signal here in the center are phase shifted as if the surface had this shape instead. So we are taking a flat surface, we change these properties so it behaves as if it were bended. In that way, we can focus the reflected signal from this surface as a like beam or focusing at a particular point in a particular direction towards the user. And if it's close, it's really a focusing on one point. If the user is far away, it's the focusing towards infinity, which creates a beam. Okay, so this is then some intuition about how these surfaces are behaving. Let's go into the mathematics. So mathematically, we have a transmitter in this example with one antenna. We have a receiver with one antenna, just so we can focus on what is happening when the signals that is transmitted is interacting with an RAS. In this case, the RAS is divided into n different elements, capital N. The channel, this is a narrowband channel, so the channel from the transmitter to each of the elements here can be described only by one complex scalar, which is describing the amplitude and the phase shift over the channel. So to element one, we have H1, to element capital N, we have HN. And when the signal is leaving one of the elements, there is a channel, physical one, to the receiver. There is a channel vector G here where I'm gathering the signals G1 to Gn from element one, two, three, and so on to capital N. So this is describing the signals uh, propagation to and from the surface. What happens within the surface? Well, each of these elements can phase shift the signals. They can also change the amplitudes, but in this presentation, I will focus on the phase shifts only. So I will assume that the amplitude isn't changed. So the phase shift is just we multiply with e to the power minus j theta one to theta n is different in different elements. And I gather the channel elements to the surface in H from the surface in G and within the surface I have omega theta as a subscript and that is because I want to point out that theta this phase shift is something that we can control. How do we compute the end to end channel? 
from the transmitter to the receiver? Well, we have the superposition principle of wireless uh, propagation, which says that we can compute the channel from the transmitter to the receiver through each of the different elements, and then we can add it up. So to element n, here is lowercase n, I have hn, I have gn, and I have e to the power minus j theta n. So here I have this multiplication of these coefficients. I add them up for all the elements, and that will then describe my n-to-n -end channel. The signal that is transmitted here will be multiplied with this factor on its way to the receiver when we are modeling everything in the complex space band. And if we would like to make use of these vector notations, which is very useful, what we should see is that we have inner products, which we can write in a number of different ways, because we have multiplication between three different things. But the most convenient thing for our purposes is to keep the phase shift vector as a vector from the right hand side here. Then we see that each element should be multiplied with one element from each of these vectors. So we take the element wise product between the two vectors. And we see then that it's sort of the combined effect of the two channels that is behaving and, and determining the properties and not the individual ones. So the Hadamard or element wise product between two vectors and then inner product between that result and the phase shift vector. Okay, so what is then the purpose of having the RS? Well, probably that you would like to get a channel that is as good as possible. And good as possible means that we can tune the phase shift. We can tune this vector here. And suppose we would like to configure the RS to maximize the sync to noise ratio. Well, then it's probably the absolute value square of this coefficient that we would like to maximize. How can we make sure that this happens? Well, we could remember that when we are adding up different uh, complex numbers, if we are adding up positive and negative numbers, they are partially canceling out each other. If we are adding up positive and positive numbers, they are building on top of each other, we get the larger and larger number all the time. And in the same way, if we have elements with different complex faces and we add them up, they will partially cancel out each other. So what we would like to make sure is that all of the signals that we're adding up here have the same face. And we can do that by looking at each element in H times G. We're figuring out what argument do we have there, that is the face, and then we pick theta n to be equal to that one, because the minus sign here will then make sure that we are cancelling out each other. And then every term here will be positive and real valued. When that happens, here is the, uh, I write up the same thing as here, but just absolute value squares. Then if all of the elements here are positive and real valued, well then we can remove the face here. We can just take the absolute values of them. And then we are summing them up and squared them. Another way of writing that is to take this vector here with the element wise products. We take the one norm, which is just taking the absolute values of all the elements, and then we uh, are squaring this norm. And then we get to this result. So that is how we are configuring the system when we have a narrow band channel. Before we move on, let's look at how we can actually implement the phase shift within an RS. Here is an implementation example that uh, some of my colleagues in China was creating. It's a prototype for 5.8 gigahertz band. It's a Wi-Fi band. It contains 20 times 55 columns. So there's over a thousand elements here uh, that we can configure. And each one of them is a patch with a certain uh, varic diodes and dielectric substrates and materials that you can find more details on in this paper. But the important thing is that we can change something that we call the bias voltage. That is a voltage that can be changed in order to change the reflection coefficient. The reflection coefficient is computed like this. We take the impedance of the air that is around it, and we take the impedance of the, uh, the element here as a whole. And we take the difference here, and here we take the sum of it, and we compute this ratio. The absolute value of it is describing what happens with the amplitude before reflection, and the phase is saying what is happening with the phase shift of the signals before we are getting the signal being re-radiated again. So in that way we can figure out what delay we will have and what fraction of the signals get reflected as compared to absorbed. And for the particular implementation that was considering this paper, here is the phase response. That is what is of interest for us here. And we are zooming in 
at 5.8 gigahertz band and this uh, small interval here is the 20 megahertz that was used in this paper for communications. But we are also plotting the result for a larger range. So what we can see is that we have different curves here for different bias voltages. And if we assign a bias voltage of zero volt, uh, then we are getting a phase shift of say minus 110 degrees. Then we can increase the bias voltage and progressively we are increasing the phase shift value from uh, to minus 90 degree up to zero degrees up to plus 90 plus 120 degrees so we can achieve a large range of different phase shifts values here within our desired band depending on what bias voltage we are applying so what is important here i would say is that uh, we should see that there is a way of achieving phase shift that we can implement and uh, we are building elements and we are changing something like a bias voltage in order to change the phase shift. But these devices here are not frequency flat. Uh, so they are varying over the frequency domain, but within a 20 megahertz bandwidth, which is rather typical in wireless communications, uh, we have a roughly uh, linear behavior here. So then we can treat it as being frequency flat. But within a 20 megahertz bandwidth, we typically don't have a communication channel that is flat. So over the frequency domain, the channel might change much more rapidly than the element is changing. So this is a typical behavior for a frequency selective channel. Here I'm showing a thousand different subcarriers and I'm showing what will be the path loss to a receiver depending on in which directions we are sending beams. And we can see that it's just changing up and down here in a chaotic manner. Uh, for some subcarriers there are some angles that are good, but others that are not. And then the behavior is changing entirely for other subcarriers. So in non-line of sight situations we have strong frequency selectivity saying that uh, between different angles and between different subcarriers, it's varying up and down a lot. And in order to deal with this in 5G, we are making use of what is known as digital beamforming, where every antenna in our array that is then used in order to create beams are connected to its own baseband processing unit. Why? Well, then we can create different beams on different subcarriers because we are deciding on what we should happen at the different subcarriers in the digital baseband. And we don't need to lock ourselves into just picking one angle here because we can change everything on all the antennas in this particular way. In some propagation environment, however, when we have a long line of sight component that is strong, or generally when we have line of sight components, it is typically 10 times or more stronger than the sum of all the other scattered components. And then it will look more like this. So we have different subcarriers, we have different variations here, but on certain angles, like this one here, we can see that this angle is good on almost all subcarriers. Uh, so this is essentially one strong path, and then there is on top of it small variations due to all of the scattered paths. And in these kind of situations, which might happen in millimeter wave communications, people are talking a lot about that we can use analog beamforming. And that is also what many of the first 5G products on millimeter wave is utilizing. So in uh, a analog beamforming scenario, we only have one digital baseband unit, which means that we can decide on what should be placed on different subcarriers, but we cannot decide on what beam angle to use on the different subcarriers. We need to pick one and use it on all the subcarriers because the beam is determined by these phase shift units here. So one angular beam we can create here with analog beam forming must be the same on all subcarriers, which means that this kind of solution mainly makes sense in line of sight scenarios. And we should remember this is essentially what an RAS is doing. It's not an antenna array that is transmitting the signal. We don't have the digital baseband in the RS, but we have the same kind of functionality, one phase shift uh, per element. So we should expect it to be sensitive to the frequency selectivity. 
that we should focus on particular propagation environment where we have a strong line of sight path. So to put this more into the context of communications, we need to have a system model. And we will consider an OFDM system model or orthogonal frequency uh, division multiplexing. And uh, we will say that from the transmitter to the surface, there are multiple distinct paths. I call them H1 to HLH. So this is a number of distinct paths. They could represent one line of sight component that just goes directly from the transmitter to the RS, but it could also represent a number of different scattering clusters that are small enough so that they can be represented by just one vector here. Uh, and then we have many of them for different scattering clusters at different locations. In the same way, when the signals get reflected from the RS, we have some distinct paths to the receiver, represented by different channel vectors that are describing some directivity towards a cluster that is then leading to a receiver or a direct path. But we can't change the fact that we only have one vector describing the phase shifts within the RS. So when we try to create a end-to-end -end channel, now when we have multiple paths, what we will have is that some paths are longer than others and therefore they will create longer delays. And a signal can make it through path H1 and then through G1, G2, GL, G. So there is a combination between every path here and every path here can interact with each other. So that's why I have a summation here over all of the paths to the surface, all of the paths from the surface, there are L, G, different of those. For each one of them, we have just as before a element-wise product between their respective channel vectors. And this is just one vector, but what is important is how long time does it take for the signal to go over channel H1 and then G1. Well, that will be a particular delay that we need to add up for the two different paths. And I have for each of the different paths here, I have assigned for simplicity an integer value delay here. So it could go from you know, zero and upwards and uh, then this is the Kronecker delta function. So each of the paths are only showing up in one of my capital M taps. If they're very fast, both of these integer delays are zero and they are appearing in the first tap. If one of them is slower, so it have a four as its delay and the other one is fast, so it's a zero, well then we take zero plus four, it appears in the fourth tap and so on. And here I have a vector that I'm multiplying with here, and it's different for every piece in this summation here. So we get a, a matrix, which is the number of elements, n times the number of taps, n, and that is then describing our channel in the time domain. When we are creating this into an OFDM system all, what we are doing in, when we are creating OFDM, we add a cyclic prefix, then we go to the DFT domain, and then we are getting the subcarrier channels. I assume we have k subcarriers, k needs to be uh, greater than the number of taps and typically it's much larger and then we have the channels on the different taps we obtain them how where well, we take v we take the transverse between v and the phase shift vector it's the same principle as before but we also took one of these ones took the transverse and multiplied with uh, the uh, phase shift vector but since we are transforming everything to the frequency domain we also are multiplying with this dft matrix and this is actually a dft matrix of dimension k by k, where we have chopped off some of the uh, columns here in order to make sure that we can actually multiply things together here. So this is how we are computing the OFDM system model. So how can we create the channels in a situation like this? Well, we need to have a sense of what is the shape of an RS. Well, it is a two-dimensional surface. And in signal processing, we have been analyzing for a long time how does a two-dimensional surface behave when signals are reaching it or leaving it. And that's what we call array signal processing. So when the signal comes from a point in the far field or is leaving towards a point in the far field, we can talk about plane waves. And the plane wave have a particular directivity determined by an azimuth angle in the horizontal plane from minus pi to plus pi, and an elevation angle from 
uh, downward, which is minus pi over 2, and upwards, which is pi over 2, and 0, 0 between these two angles is then something that goes perpendicularly out of the surface. So say that we have capital N different elements in this uh, surface here. It lies in the y set plane, and we have a particular location of element N. Then we can define what is known as the array response vector. Uh, and th this is then describing what will be the phase shift of the different elements with respect to each other and with particular with respect to the origin in our coordinate system when a signal comes in from a particular angular direction determined by estimate angle or elevation angle or both of them actually. So we are for each element we take an inner product between the location of the element and with what is known as the wave vector. It contains 2 pi divided by lambda, the wavelength, so that is sort of determining how much the phase shifts, uh, a particular distance, what phase shift does that correspond to. And then we have this vector here with cosines and sines at the different angles. This is uh, where we are pinpointing one point on the unit sphere, uh, the one in this particular direction. So if we take the inner product between the wave vector and the location here, we put it as a phase shift here in e to the power j times that number, and we stack it for all of the different elements. Then we get the array response vector containing the phase shift when the signal comes in from this pair of angles, or also if it leaves towards that direction. And we can use these principles in order to model all of the channels that we get when we are working with RS. So the channel HL from the surface, or, or to the surface, uh, if that signal comes in from a scattering cluster located in a particular direction. Then we just take the array response vector, we multiply it with a constant with a, a phase shift and a amplitude that's determining how strong the signal is that comes from that cluster. And in the same way, we can apply it for all of the channels to the surface, all of the channels from the surface. It's just going to be different constant, different angles here. Okay, so that is how we can generate our channels. So for a given channels, how can we determine how we should configure our RS in the OFDM system? Well, we would probably like to maximize the performance in terms of rate or SNR. And previously, we were only maximizing the SNR because we only have one subcarrier. So maximizing that SNR is the same thing as maximizing the rate. But when we have k different subcarriers, we can't maximize all of the SNRs at the same time. So that's why we should care about the sum rate. And the sum rate is to take the summation over all our subcarriers, log 201 plus some kind of transmit power divided by noise power. And here we have what I called uh, row k, which was the channel that we defined previously to that particular subcarrier, and we take the absolute value square. And then we should multiply with the bandwidth and divide by the number of subcarriers, and also by m minus 1 here is added because we need a cyclic prefix in OFDM to deal with the intersymbol interference. If we replace rho k with the expression that we had for the channels in the OFDM case, we should remember that what it contained. We had omega, which is the configuration of the surface. We have v, which is describing the channel. And then we have the DFT matrix. And on subcarrier k, we should take up only the rho k in f. So this is the notation for that one. And what is the issue here? Well, the issue is that we would like to maximize the sum rate with respect to this vector here. But each subcarrier will have a different vector that is taken in the product with. So which of the different subcarriers should we optimize it with respect to? Let us start by considering an upper bound where we are able to somehow optimize our RES on every subcarrier individually. If we are optimizing for the K subcarrier, then we remember from before we should make sure to phase shift so that we take this vector here and we make sure that we have the same phase shifts in this one but with the opposite sign and in that way we would get this vector here with the one norm squared. So that was the same thing as we had in the narrowband case. So an upper bound would be achieved if we are just replacing each of these component with this value here. So we magically could optimize the RS on a per subcarrier basis. But we can't get that in reality, so this is not bound. A heuristic solution. Well, there are different options one can think about. One is to just focus on one subcarrier and optimize for that one. 
that turned out to not work particularly well because the sub carriers are changing a lot and we have different superpositions of the channels from uh, and to the surfaces at the different sub carriers that are adding up in different ways. The best solution uh, that is at least a simple one is something called the strongest path maximization that a number of different papers have been suggesting. And the idea here is that we are, instead of focusing on the sub carriers, we are going through our m different time delays here, one to m, different taps. And for each one of them, we are figuring out which of the taps that is the strongest one, contains the most amount of energy. And then for this one, we are picking out this index and then we are maximizing the uh, strength of that particular path. And then we hope that if we make the strongest path uh, as strong as possible, then that will help all the sub carriers because that strong signal power will be spread out over all the sub carriers. And if we also are thinking about that this might be a line of sight path, then we are essentially locking in on the line of sight path and try to make it as strong as possible. So here is an example of what could happen in these situations. I have a transmitter and I have a receiver. There's 200 meters between them and we have a non-line of sight model here with a lot of scattering. Between transmitter and the RS, I have an either line of sight or non-line of sight path. And it's also 200 meters. And then there's 20 meters between the RS and the receiver and there there is always a line of sight path and it's a half a meter times half a meter surface. And if we assume that we have a line of sight path here, then we have line of sight to and from the surface. And in this case, when I'm increasing the bandwidth, I get the following behaviors in terms of rate uh, over uh, the channel. So if I don't have an RS, since we get more bandwidth, of course, the rate will increase. And when I have no RS, I actually replace the RS with a metal sheet with homogeneous surface, just to make sure that we are not losing that path entirely. Then the red curve here is an upper bound and the dash curve is what I get with the strongest uh, tap maximization. So what we are getting in this situation is something that is rather close to the upper bound because most of the energy comes in that strongest path. But if we are instead replacing this line of sight path with a non line of sight, so we're taking away that strong path from it, then we can see that the range of numbers is decreasing a lot. The upper bound still having a gap, but the benefit of the RS is collapsing entirely. Why? Well, because we, even if we can zoom in on one of the taps or one of few subcarriers and make it stronger, there are still so many subcarriers, so it doesn't make a big difference. So this is telling us that an RS is only effective when we have a line of sight path to and from the surface, at least when we are talking about uh, having multiple subcarriers. And we can experimentally validate this. Here's a scenario uh, from my colleagues in China who uh, was developing this um, RS that I was mentioning earlier. The experiment that was done here over 50 meters on the rooftop of a building, there was a transmitter here, transmitting over 20 megahertz of bandwidth at the 5.8 gigahertz band. There's 50 meters here to a copper plate. And here I have a receive antenna. There is a horn antennas at both locations. So this on purpose directive. With the copper plate, I'm measuring the signals here. Here is the 5.8 gigahertz uh, frequency and here is a 20 megahertz. So we can see some uh, signal power here. But compared to the noise that we get in the neighboring bands, there is no really uh, visible signal power there. So it's a really weak signal. If we are replacing the copper plate with RS on the same location, then we are instead getting the following result. A much stronger signal within the band and then, of course, there is some out of band uh, signaling as always, but uh, in the band we get a 27 dB signal power. And the out of band effects, it's not created by the RS, it's already there in the signals, in these Wi Fi signals. So we can see that it's actually possible to implement something like this in a line of sight scenario. So, to try to summarize some of these things here that I have discovered when working with OFDM systems, I have seen the following, that if we add a direct path to the system, I will only briefly go through this scenario uh, where I also have a varying quality of the direct path to transmit and receiver, and this is for simplicity and narrowband scenario. Then one, what we can see is that if we have a weak path uh, and we add an RS, 
the capacity is growing quite substantially when I'm adding more elements. While if I have a strong path uh, between transmitter and receiver, then the additional gain that the RS is providing is much smaller, which is telling us that an RS is only effective when the direct path is really weak. When it comes to things like channel estimation, we should remember that the RS is a blind type of thing. So how can we learn how to configure? Well, we essentially need one of the devices, say the users, transmit multiple times, try out different configurations, solve some kind of optimization problem to determine what configuration we should utilize, and then feedback that to the controller here. And the entire channel estimation problem will be determined by how many parameters there are to estimate. So if you remember, uh, for example, the channel to the surface, we have LH different uh, channel vectors. Each one of them is a constant times an array response vector with a particular angles. And if we just count the number of parameters in V, the channel matrix, then we have N times M complex parameters. But if we only have a few paths, we can start counting the number of parameters that are describing these paths. Then we get the multiplication between two different paths and we don't really know exactly how to, to deal with that yet, I would say. But uh, at least I would say that we have this kind of uh, extremes between only estimating all the parameters here in a blind manner uh, and then we have NM parameters, which might be 1000 or 10,000 different elements to compute. While if we have only line of sight to and from, we, we probably don't even need to know this uh, gain parameter here. We only need to know the the angles. And then there are two angles to, two angles from the surface, there is four parameters. So it sort of demonstrates that when we have line of sight, we have much fewer parameters to estimate. And even if there are some diffuse scattering addition to the line of sight, we can focus on the line of sight paths because that is what our strong because tap maximization want to do. So to sum up here, there are cases when we have strong direct path, a weak direct path, non-line of sight to and from, or line of sight to and from. And here I mean that we have both to and from the RS. As soon as you have non-line of sight scenarios, the RS will not be particularly effective in OFDM systems, so it doesn't make much sense to use it, it seems. And it's also difficult to estimate the channels even. Uh, difficult to estimate and configure. And if you have a strong path and line of sight, uh, well, if the strong path is there, the RS will have to be very large before it becomes really a uh, device that is improving the SNR, relatively speaking, by a large amount. So the best use case is really when we have a weak direct path and we have line of sight to and from the RS. Then we get large gains from OFDM because there is only a strong path that, uh, in the line of sight component that we can lock into uh, our configuration and a few parameters to estimate and the RS is effective compared to direct path as well. There are open problems in the OFDM area that I think we should work a lot on because uh, there has been way too much research into uh, the narrowband case, which will probably not be utilized at all. And uh, we therefore need to go deeper into the wideband scenario. So find efficient RS configurations in OFDM scenarios uh, when we have amplitude variations, when we have limited resolutions on the different elements, so we cannot optimize them to any real valued number when it comes to the phases or amplitudes. This is something that we need to look into and also take effects like mutual coupling into account. And I took a first look at this and this particular paper. And having a more effective estimation algorithm that utilize spatial correlation, utilize line of sight properties and things like that is something that is important. And we also brushed a little bit on the surface in this paper. And finally, it's also important to improve the system models when it comes to the RS. Use better models for how the elements are behaving, in particular their response over frequency. If we have a lot of bandwidth, then they will vary over the bandwidth as well. And we need to be able to deal with scenarios where the RS is frequency selective. So in conclusion, OFDM is what we need to use in practice to make it uh, reasonable. And it works well in one particular use case when we have a line of sight path uh, to and from the RS, but a weak signal from the transmitter to the receiver. And then we get weak frequency selectivity, few parameters to estimate we can handle large practical bandwidth because even if there are many uh, diffuse scattered paths towards me here as the receiver, the main power will come through the window to the RS, be reflected in this main beam angle here, and then it will work very well. 
Thank you for listening.